evening, I'm Alma Angeles, and you're watching Eagle News International on tonight's headlines. French President Emmanuel Macron heads to Moscow, hoping for a deal with Vladimir Putin to ease fears of a Russian invasion of Ukraine. Morocco prepared Monday to bury little Ryan, the five-year-old boy who died trapped in a well despite a days-long rescue operation that gripped the world. All roads to the leading to the Philippine Arena in Santa Maria, Bulacan on Tuesday for the proclamation rally of the entire BBM Sara Uni team as volunteers started to flock to the area as early as Saturday last week. Metropolitan Manila Development Authority or MMDA Chair Benjamin Benhar Abalos on Monday has resigned from his post to focus on his new task as campaign manager of a presidential aspirant and former Senator Ferdinand Bongbong Marcus Jr. First in our news, U.S. intelligence assessments say Russia is stepping up preparations for a large-scale invasion of Ukraine and has now put in place 70 percent of its forces it would need to such an attack. President Biden was asked if war troops could soon be on the way, and here's what he had to say. There's nothing new about that. Are you willing to send more troops to Poland and other NATO countries if Putin has not the I'm not going to speculate on that. Do you think there's any particular thing that Vladimir Putin is looking for, sir, in order to make this decision? I think things he cannot get. Now, Russia has assembled 110,000 troops along its border with Ukraine. But U.S. intelligence had not determined if President Vladimir Putin has actually decided to invade, according to officials who in recent days held briefings with members of Congress and European allies. One estimate says if Russia does opt for a full-scale attack, the invading force could take the capital Kiev and topple President Volodymyr Zelensky in a matter of 48 hours. Officials said such an attack would leave 25,000 to 50,000 civilians dead, along with 5,000 to 25,000 Ukrainian soldiers and 3,000 to 10,000 Russian ones. It could also trigger a refugee flood of 1 to 5 million people, mainly to Poland. But Russia denies that it is planning to invade Ukraine. Meanwhile, French President Emmanuel Macron heads to Moscow today, hoping to reach a deal with President Vladimir Putin over Ukraine at the start of a week of intense diplomacy over fears Russia is preparing an invasion of its pro-Western neighbor. Take a look. That with tens of thousands of Russian troops camped on the border with Ukraine, Macron will be the first top Western leader to meet with Putin since the crisis kicked off in December. Russia insists it has no plans to attack and has instead put forward its own demands for security guarantees that it says would ease tensions. Macron, who will head to Kiev on Tuesday for talks with Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky, said before leaving Paris that he would be looking to find historic solutions with President Putin. The Kremlin issued a statement saying the Putin-Macron meeting is important, but no breakthrough is expected. President Putin said he wants to avoid war with NATO bloc at all costs. He also hopes to steer away from further negative developments, and he pledges dialogue towards mutual security between Russia, Ukraine, and EU if Moscow's proposals are considered. Meanwhile, Chancellor Olaf Scholz says Germany is prepared to send extra troops to the Baltic states. Germany has also been criticized for its refusal to send weapons to Ukraine, though it did suggest sending 5,000 helmets instead. Take a look. Germany, which has... ...seit vielen Jahren einen klaren Kurs, dass wir nicht in Krisengebiete liefern und dass wir auch keine letalen Waffen 
in die Ukraine liefern. Das hat schon meine Frage. Germany, which has refused to provide weapons to Ukraine in the face of a possible Russian invasion, offered to send 5,000 helmets instead, a move slammed as an absolute joke by the mayor of Kiev. Kiev Mayor Vitali Klitschko accused Germany of failing to understand that we are dealing with a highly equipped Russian army that could start uh, further invading Ukraine at any moment. 5,000 helmets are an absolute joke, he told the Bildi Daily. What will Germany send next? Pillows? Germany has refused to supply Ukraine with weapons, claiming this would further inflame the conflict. Germany's gas pipeline project, the Nord Stream 2, with Russia could also be behind Germany's softer approach. Germany is waiting for the Nord Stream 2 gas pipeline pipeline to go into operation as soon as possible. It's meant to bring natural gas from Russia to Germany. Another one is history. According to the LA Times, quote, the Ukraine standoff has resonance in Germany, home of the Berlin Wall, which stood for nearly 30 years as an emblem of the Cold War. But there are other powerful historical touchstones, as well as including a sense of shame over the country's Nazi past, which left it it, uh, which left it reticent about taking the lead on security issues in Europe, unquote. A large contingent of U.S. troops landed in Poland on Sunday, on Sunday as part of a reinforcement due to tensions with Russia, with their commander saying they aimed to deter any war aims and defend NATO if needed. Take a look. The deployment of elements of the 82nd Airborne Division are here to enhance the readiness, interoperability across all domains uh, with our Polish allies and, uh, if necessary, defend any portion of NATO. This uh, deployment is a prudent measure uh, to ensure that, that collectively that uh, with prevention of any war aims is defensive in nature. Uh, and clearly, this is about ensuring uh, the protection of all of the alliance. Paratroopers from the U.S. Army's 82nd Airborne Division based in Fort Bragg in the U.S. landed at around 1,300 GMT at Reskov Airport in southeast Poland on a U.S. Air Force Boeing C-17. Poland, a former communist bloc country which borders Ukraine and joined NATO in 1999, already hosts around 4,500 U.S. troops on rotation. Preparations for the latest arrivals have been ongoing since last week and some soldiers landed on Saturday. Poland said there would be more arrivals in the coming hours. 100 kilometers from the Russian border in the icy forest of Estonia, the winter camp exercise is putting NATO troops to the test in extreme winter conditions. Long planned, this annual exercise brings together 1,300 British, French, and Estonian soldiers. Following Russia's annexation of Crimea in 2014, NATO sent an enhanced forward presence of multinational battalions to Poland and the Baltics. Meanwhile, in Morocco, the country is preparing to bury little Ryan, the five-year-old boy who died trapped in a well despite a days-long rescue operation that gripped the world. The parents of little Ryan expressed their sorrow. Let's take a look. On Saturday night, crowds had cheered in joy when rescue workers reached Ryan after a round-the-clock digging operation, clearing away the final handfuls of dirt. But hope turned to grief as news spread that the rescue was too late and Ryan was dead. The news was announced by the Royal Cabinet of the North African Nation after King Mohammed VI called the parents with his condolences. The race to rescue Ryan was followed live across the world and the rescue was not easy. The shaft, just 45 centimeters or 18 inches across, was too narrow for Ryan to be reached directly and widening it was deemed too risky. So earth movers dug a wide slope into the hill. Rescue crews, 
using bulldozers and front-end loaders, excavated the surrounding red earth down to the level where the boy was trapped before drill teams created a horizontal tunnel to reach him from the side to avoid causing a landslide. Social media users from regional rival Algeria to France and the U.S. flooded the Internet with messages of support and grief along with praise for the rescue workers. In other news, Cyclone Batsirai killed at least 20 people and displaced nearly 48,000 when it struck Madagascar overnight. Many homes were destroyed and flooded and residents are imploring the state to help them. Take a look. Madagascar was already reeling from a tropical storm which killed 55 people weeks earlier. And the latest extreme weather event came as South African President Cyril Ramaphosa said the continent is bearing both the brunt and the cost of global warming. But Sire made landfall on the Indian Ocean Islands east on Saturday evening, bringing heavy rain and winds of 165 kilometers per hour after drenching the French island of La Réunion. UNICEF warned that many of the victims were likely to be children, which make up more than 50 percent of the country's population. The Mateo France Weather Service had earlier predicted Batsirai would pose a very serious threat to Madagascar after passing Mauritius and drenching the French island of La Réunion with torrential rain. Some 10,000 people on La Réunion were still without electricity on Sunday, three days after the tropical cyclone passed through the island, injuring 12 people on its path. In other news, a royal bombshell, Queen Elizabeth announced Charles' wife will be Queen Camilla when he takes the throne. Here's Eribel Celestino joining us live from our UK bureau. Hello, Eribel. Hi, Alma, and yes, Queen Elizabeth II on Sunday became the first British monarch to reign for seven decades, announcing her sincere wish that Camilla, the wife of her heir, Prince Charles, should ultimately be known as Queen Consort. Britain's longest uh, monarch acceded to the throne aged 23 on February 6, 1952, following the death of her father, King George VI. She marked the historic date quietly as Sandringham, her estate in eastern England where her father died. But in a major statement on the future of the royal family, the 95-year-old released a message to the nation saying, it is my sincere wish that when the time comes, Camilla will be known as Queen Concert. This means Camilla, now 74, would be crowned alongside Charles, now 73, and known to the public as Queen Camilla, royal experts said. Charles said the, the couple were deeply conscious of the honor represented by my mother's wish, which would accord Camilla the full title of a monarch's wife. He praised Camilla, saying, my darling wife has been my own steadfast support throughout. The heir to the throne also paid tribute to the queen's devotion to the welfare of all her people, which inspires great, a still greater admiration with each passing year. The queen said she hoped that when Charles becomes, queen, uh, becomes king, the British people would give him and Camilla the same support that you have given me. Camilla was long vilified for her role in the breakup of Charles' marriage to Princess Diana. Recognizing the sensitivities when the couple married in 2005, the royal family announced she would be known as Princess Consort after Charles becomes king. But she has get gradually won plaudits as the future king's loyal wife. Stressing that Queen is actively working 
Buckingham Palace released a photo taken at Sandringham this week showing her going through one of her famous red dispatch boxes used for government business. Prime Minister Boris Johnson praised the Queen's inspirational sense of duty and unwavering dedication. With the main Platinum Jubilee celebration set for June, he said he wanted to come together as a country to celebrate her historic reign. Four days of festivities are planned for early June, coinciding with the anniversary of her 1953 coronation, including a military parade and music concert, street parties, a nationwide big jubilee lunch, and a plenum pudding competition. Well, Alma, during her reign, the queen has remained a constant through periods of huge social and political upheaval, a, link, a living link to Britain's post-war and imperial past. In September 2015, she surpassed Queen Victoria's 63 years and seven months on the throne. And despite some health concerns over the past year, her latest message showed she is determined to continue her record-breaking reign. After a uh, husband, uh, Philip's death in April last year, um, the Queen returned to the public and official engagements, including hosting world leaders at the G7 summit. She was also forced to slow down on advice from doctors. However, after an overnight hospital stay in October sparked a public concern. Since then, she has largely stayed at Windsor Castle and made few public appearances. But on Saturday, the Queen held a reception for locals at Sandringham, reportedly her largest in-person public engagement since the autumn health scare. Back to you, Alma. Thank you very much for that update. Everybody, stay safe. Thank you so much for having me, Alma. From London, United Kingdom, I am Arabel Celestino, and we live in interesting times. In other news, all roads lead to the Philippine Arena in Santa Maria, Bulacan on Tuesday for the proclamation rally of the entire BBM Sarah Uni team as volunteers started to flock to the area as early as Saturday last week. The proclamation of presidential aspirant Ferdinand or Bongbong Marcos Jr. and his running mate Davao City Mayor Sara Duterte will be the centerpiece of the occasion, which will be also highlighted by the formal introduction of the entire Uni team senatorial ticket. Preparations for the big event event have started as early as Saturday morning with volunteers um, meticulously uh, putting the final touches until Monday evening to ensure that there will be no hitches when the BBM Sarah Uni team kicks off its campaign. At least 25,000 supporters from all over the country are expected to troop to the multi-purpose facility which is tagged by the Guinness World Records as the world's largest indoor arena. The Philippine arena boasts of a 55,000 seating capacity but only 25,000 will be allowed to witness this event in, difference, in deference to health protocols. Unit team event organizers said security will be tight and only those who are fully vaccinated will be allowed inside the arena. The event will start at 4 p.m. and is expected to end around 7 p.m. but not before Marcos and Duterte introduce their official senatorial lineup composed of Senators Sherwin Gachalian and Juan Miguel Zubiri and former Defense Secretary Gilbert Yodoro. They are joined by former Public Works and Highway Secretary Mark Villar, former Palace Spokesperson Harry Roque, Representative Lauren Legarda, former Senator Jingo Estrada, Representative Rodante Marcoleta, former Quezon City Mayor Herbert Bautista, lawyer Larry Gadon, and former Senator and Information and Communications Technology Secretary Gringo Honasan II. Other aspirants are also expected to conduct their proclamation rallies, but they will be held at smaller venues. Political analysts said the uh, Marcos Duterte tandem is definitely the team to beat in the May 2022 elections, as shown by the massive support it has been receiving on the ground and backed by the overwhelming results from all reputable survey firms in the country. 
Metropol Metropolitan Manila Development Authority or MMDA Chairman Benjamin Benhar Abalos on Monday has resigned from his post to focus on his new task as campaign manager of his good friend, presidential aspirant and former Senator Bongbong Marcos Jr. Let's listen in. I respectfully tender my resignation effective the end of business hour, February 7, 2022. The campaign period is fast approaching and I will need to devote my time to Senator Bongbong Marcos' campaign as his national campaign manager. The news continues here on Eagle News. We'll be right back. Alam namin ang iyong pagsisikap. Dama namin ang iyong mga sakripisyo. Kita namin ang pagharap mo sa bawat pagsubok. Kaya sa kabila ng mga hamon ng buhay, nandito kami para umalalay. Kasi katulad mo, gusto rin namin ang magandang bukas para sa kanya. Hatid namin ang dekalidad na edukasyon at makabagong pasilidad sa abot kayang halaga. Kaya huwag ka nang mangamba. Sasamahan ka namin to pa rin ang mga pangarap niya. Maaasahan mong sulit dito ang mga pinagsikapan mo. Sa aming mga makabagong pasilidad at sistema ng edukasyon. May lalabas natin ang aking talino at mga kakayahan niya. Kahit sa munting halaga, makakasiguro ka na makakasabay siya sa mabilis na pag-ikot ng mundo. Sa new era, karamay mo kami sa bawat hamon. Kaagapay mo kami sa bawat hakbang. Kasama mo kami sa bawat niti at tagumpay. back. The number of new COVID-19 cases in the country has further declined to 6,835 today. Now, this is a significant drop from Sunday's 8,361 fresh infections based on the latest COVID-19 bulletin of the Department of Health. Monday's active case count has reached 116,720, a drop from Sunday's 126,227. Meanwhile, another 16,330 recoveries raised the recovery count to 3,445,129, or 95.3% of a total of 3,616,387 confirmed infections since the start of the pandemic in 2020. It also reported 12 new deaths, bringing the country's total to 54,538 deaths or 1.51% of confirmed cases. Meanwhile, Australians welcome the announcement made by Prime Minister Scott Morrison that the country will reopen its borders to tourists from February 21. First, let's take a look. I just made the announcement that we're reopening the international borders on the 21st of February this year to all vaccinated, fully vaccinated, that's two doses of the vaccine of international travellers, so in particular international visitors. Uh, they will join the backpackers and the students and others who have been able to come so far. So this is going to be good news for the tourism industry. We're getting back to normal as much as we possibly can. We need international borders to open, I think, you know, because Australia is a globalised country, you know. You put the border to globalise economy, you're done. You smash, you know. About time. Um, it's exciting. Um, it's almost like an end of a, a period of hermit kingdomness ending. So I'm just really excited. I mean, opportunities is what we want. So opportunities to leave the country and come back. And there's not enough workers to pick the crops and do all that. Yeah. 
Australia's borders slammed shut in March 2020 in the hope of protecting the island continent against a surging global pandemic. For most of the time since then, Australians have been barred from leaving and only a handful of visitors have been granted exemptions to enter. The rules have stranded nationals overseas, split families, hammered the country's multi-billion dollar tourist industry and prompted often bitter debates about Australia's status as a modern, open and outward looking nation. Every month of border closures has cost businesses an estimated 2.6 billion US dollars according to the Australian Chamber of Commerce and Industry. Despite the announcement, travel within Australia will still be restricted. The vast state of Western Australia remains closed to most non-residents, though. It is currently easier to travel from Sydney to Paris than Sydney to Perth. And demonstrators waving Canadian flags outside Parliament in Canada's capital of Ottawa, demanding an end to COVID vaccine mandates as protests against pandemic restrictions enter their second week. Take a look. I left my job. I didn't wait to be fired. I chose not to get vaccinated, yes. Yeah, so uh, last weekend I was here on Saturday and uh, I was here from the hours of 12 till around 5.30 when uh, a group of the occupiers came up to me and they started harassing me. They ripped the sign out of my hand and the police showed up and I was expecting them to do something about it. However, what they did was escort me and my friend back to the or back to the train station and uh, made sure we got on that train so that we uh, weren't allowed going back to their uh, demonstration. Ottawa's mayor declared a state of emergency over the, quote, out-of-control anti-vaxxer and anti-mask truckers protest, which has paralyzed the Canadian capital for two weeks. Mayor Jim Watson announced a state of emergency that, quote, reflects the serious danger and threat to the safety and security of residents posed by the ongoing demonstrations and highlights the need for support from other jurisdictions and levels of government. That, according to a statement from the city. Earlier in the day, Watson had described the situation as completely out of control, adding that the protesters have far more people than we have police officers. Watson called the truckers insensitive as they have continued blaring horns and sirens and fireworks and turning it into a party. The truckers and their supporters have dug in, however, saying the protest will continue until the COVID-related restrictions are lifted. Ottawa police are due to soon be reinforced by some 250 Royal Canadian Mounted Police, a federal force. Meanwhile, China locked down the 3.5 million inhabitants of the city of Baisi near the border with Vietnam after more than 70 cases were discovered in the past three days. Local officials in the city of Baisi and the southern Guangxi region announced Sunday that no one would be allowed to leave the city while residents of some districts would be confined to their homes. China, the only major world economy still sticking to a staunch zero COVID policy, is on high alert for any outbreaks as it hosts the Beijing Winter Olympics. And Hong Kong's zero COVID policy was on the ropes as authorities announced a record number of new infections, sending officials scrambling to ramp up testing capacity and warning that a tightening of virus control measures could be needed. On Saturday, the city recorded 351 confirmed cases, its highest daily figure since the pandemic began, with 161 cases being either untraceable or pending investigation. Hong Kong's spike in cases came on the fifth day of the Lunar New Year holidays, during which the government warned against families gathering for festivities. City leader Carrie Lam said authorities could further tighten virus control measures this week. And Papua New Guinea's Prime Minister James Marapi returned home from the Beijing Winter Olympics after a positive test scuppers a face-to-face -face meeting with Chinese President Xi Jinping. 
James Marapi was in China to attend the opening ceremony of the Winter Olympics, but returned a positive test result upon arrival in Beijing last Thursday evening, according to the government in a statement on Sunday. Marapi had been expected to meet Chinese President Xi Jinping, but instead held a virtual meeting with Premier Li Keqiang. And the first woman president of the Central American country, Shamara Castro, 62, who was elected last month, tested positive for the virus, but says she will keep working. The president is vaccinated against the virus, according to her husband, Manuel Zelaya, himself a former president who was ousted in 2009. More than 40,000 people in Honduras have been infected with COVID. More than 10,500 have died from the disease. And we'll be back with the business news right after this break. Stay tuned. Mula noon hanggang ngayon, gabay natin ang MTRCB ratings sa matalino at responsabling pananood. Sa tamang pagsunod sa MTRCB ratings, ginagawa nating ligtas at makabuluhan ang panonood ng bawat miyembro ng Pamilyang Pilipino. Lumipas man ang panahon hanggang may Pamilyang Pilipino, andyan ang MTRCB. Welcome back. Asian markets fluctuated in early trade today as a forecast busting U.S. jobs report. Reinforced optimism that the world's top economy was well on the recovery track, but also ramped up interest rate hike expectations. The much-anticipated non-farm payrolls data on Friday saw the Labor Department sharply revise up the previous three months' readings while also revealing a wage growth surge. With all important inflation reports this week tipped to show prices rising at a pace not seen for four decades, traders are becoming increasingly anguished about the U.S. Central Bank's plans to bring them under control while being careful not to jeopardize the recovery. And there is also mounting talk that officials will have to hike borrowing costs at least four times this year, with some predicting as many as seven could be on the cards. The move to tighter policies, which is likely to start in March, will bring an end to the era of ultra-cheap cash that has helped fuel a near two-year markets rally and that has been acting as a hefty weight on stocks at the start of the year. Asia was mixed in early exchanges. Shanghai led the gainers as investors returned from their week-long Lunar New Year break to play catch-up with a broadly strong week across the world markets, while Singapore, Taipei, and Jakarta were also in positive territory. However, Hong Kong dropped after surging more than 3% Friday with Tokyo, Sydney, Seoul, and Manila also down. In other business news, British construction firm Taylor Wimpy on Monday 
uh, promoted Jenny Daly to the post of chief executive, becoming only the ninth current FTSE 100 company to be led by a woman. Taylor Wimpy, which faces costly cladding repairs to many of its apartment blocks after the deadly 2017 Grenfell Tower fire hit the construction sector, said Daly would replace Pete Redfern in April. Daily currently Taylor Wimpsey's uh, chief operating officer will be paid 750 pounds or 1.0 billion US dollars per year plus potential millions more annually in performance related bonuses. Daily becomes also the first woman to head up a UK house building company. The FTSE 100 comprises Britain's biggest listed companies but less than 10% of the total have a woman CEO even with Daily's appointment. Here in the country, homegrown firm Figaro, Figaro Coffee Group Incorporated said it is continuing its planned expansion for 2022 as it's optimistic that the country's economic recovery will gain traction this year. The company plans to open 29 uh, pizza outlets from Angel, six Figaro Group Express multi-brand outlets, five Figaro coffee shops, and one Tian Ma's Taiwanese restaurant this year. As of January 21, Figaro Coffee Group operates a total of 109 stores. Justin Liu, the company's chairman, said they are optimistic that the economy will further improve this year with the alert levels coming down and vaccination drives by the government continuing with strength. Furthermore, he said he sees continued growth and strength outside Metro Manila, hence their new stores in Lipa, Cebu and Laguna. Japanese snowboarder Rina Yoshika vowed to get back on the snow after undergoing surgery following a horror crash in training at the Beijing Olympics that left her with a spinal injury and torpedoed her games. Yoshika crash landed coming off a jump on the slope style course last week and was taken away in an ambulance. The 22 year old posted on Instagram on Monday saying the surgery is over safely and vowed to get back on her board when she recovers. He, she said, I remember this crash and I'm very scared, but I don't want to end up like this, so I'm going to focus on my treatment and try to get back on the snow as soon as possible, she wrote. Yoshika said she was unable to sit up in bed after the crash and that it may take some time before she can move freely. She said she was disappointed not to be able to compete in slope style and big air at the Games. Meanwhile, Peng Shuai has met Olympic Chief Thomas Back at the Beijing Winter Olympics. According to the IOC today, the International Olympic Committee said tennis player Peng, who sparked global concern in November when she fell silent after alleging that a top Chinese politician had forced her into sex, dined with Back on Saturday and watched curling. Let's take a listen. Uh, the IOC president held a face-to-face -face meeting with Peng Shui as announced last November. He was joined by the former chair of the Athletes Commission and IOC member Kirsty Coventry. The meeting took place on Saturday over dinner at the Olympic Club in Beijing. I think we need also to listen to her and we need to, for, for, to, to read what she's saying. Um, as we've also discussed, we've been in contact with her, we remain in contact with her, we've met her in person, we've invited her to come to Europe, uh, and we will meet her again. And I think, um, I think we can say that we are doing everything we can to make sure uh, that this situation is as it should be. Peng reappeared in public nearly three weeks after her allegation and later withdrew it, insisting her online comments had been taken out of context. But fears for her safety and well-being remained. Separately, in an interview published Monday with French sports Daily L'Equipe, Peng repeated her denial. She said, I never said anyone had sexually assaulted me in any way. That according to the former world number one doubles player, asked why she deleted the social media post containing the allegation. Pang said, because I wanted to. And she said there was a huge misunderstanding in the outside world following this post. 
Meanwhile, defending champion Mikaela Schifrin was among the favorites to retain the women's giant slalom title and win a third Olympic gold medal of her career. But in bright morning sunshine, she made an error near the top of her first run and slid out. A back injury and 10 days spent in isolation after contracting COVID-19 also did not help her preparations. The American vowed to move on and quickly concentrate on Wednesday's shorter technical event in which she is a four-time world champion. And Californian-born Chinese freestyle skier Island Gu, one of the faces of the Beijing Winter Olympics, flopped her second run but withstood the pressure to reach the final of the free ski big air on Monday. The 18-year-old who was captivated or who has captivated China since switching allegiance from the United States in 2019 saw one of her skis fall off as she came down in a tangle on her second run. She briefly put her hands on her head, then scowled good-naturedly when her low score of 24.5 came through, followed by a shrug and a smile. The grade-A student, who is known in China as Gu Ailing, has been fitted in China since making the decision to represent the country of her mother's birth. She said she wants to inspire a generation of Chinese women, freestyle skiers, and more than that, be a role mod model in other ways, even though she's only a teenager herself and finally in our news Russian and Canadian women ice hockey players wore medical masks Monday for their Beijing Winter Games match after COVID results failed to arrive in time in a bizarre pandemic inspired chapter to the games Canada ran out 6-1 winners but only after a delay of one hour when the Russians found they had no opponents to play the Russian players took their masks off in the third period. The Russian players said they had done nothing wrong and that they had their daily COVID test at their normal time of 8 a.m. There have been 387 positive cases since January 23 in the bubble, according to official figures, among them an unknown number of players. And that's it for tonight's broadcast. As always, I'll end the day on a thoughtful note. Our ability to look back and smile at our past is proof that God's plan is to keep us moving forward. This has been Eagle News International. I'm Alma Angeles. Stay alert and stay informed because we live in interesting times. Good night. ating pong lipunan.